All right, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay back there in the back? Can you hear me okay? Raise your hand, thumbs up, good? Okay, awesome, thank you. Thank you. So uh, my name's Andreas Forsland. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Cognition, and I'm... Uh, so what I'm here to talk to you today about is the future of communication. Uh, so when you think about communication, naturally you think about speaking to each other or texting to each other or social media. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is really the notion of being able to use biological sensors, uh, combining that with artificial intelligence, and looking at how we can augment humanity with entirely new ways of communicating with each other that have nothing to do with speech. So let me take you back about six years. Uh, it was really the inspiration for Cognition. Uh, my mom had come to visit with me for her 70th birthday. Uh, and as she arrived, she wasn't feeling very well, and she came down with severe pneumonia. She had to be admitted into the hospital ICU. They put her on life support and a ventilator. So if you understand what it's like to be put on a ventilator, you're essentially locked into your own body. You're locked in, and she was locked in for seven weeks. I was her sole communicator, so I didn't really understand how important communication was until you couldn't speak. <clears throat> Now, if you try and empathize with me a little bit, there's actually five million people in the U.S. alone every year that are admitted into hospitals for the exact same situation that I went through. So I had to think, is there a better way, right? So work with me here for a second. It's a little interactive. So if you could imagine, look at the person next to you, uh, and without speaking or touching your nose, pretend that your nose itches and try and communicate it. How would you do it? Right? It sounds kind of like a silly exercise, but for people that are dealing with this, it's not so silly. When we step back and we actually look at the global population of over 7 billion people, about 1 billion people in the world today have a communication disability. And of those billion, 370 million of them can't speak. We're all familiar with people who have hearing impairments or vision impairments, but speech impairments are difficult to spot because oftentimes these individuals are kind of outside of the mainstream environments. Uh, and if they don't speak to you, you wouldn't know that they don't speak to you. So if we think about how humans can communicate without speech, how else would you do it? How else would you communicate? Well, obviously through some other senses, right? Uh, so when we look at these other senses, what are these other senses? Well, you think about the properties of, of sonic or audio signatures or audio patterns uh, that are not necessarily words. They can be things like humming, like hmm, 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 humming, uh, clapping your hands, uh, knocking on m materials. Uh, or has anybody, raise your hand if you've watched Breaking Bad, you know, you, the, the uncle who rings the bell, right, when it's sort of, te it's the telltale sign. These are methods that people use for communication that aren't verbal. Other things that are more natural, things like uh, a rattlesnake. You know, you hear a rattle, and the first time you hear a rattle, you don't think it's dangerous. You think it's curious, and you're trying to figure out and learn what it is. Once you learn what it is, you map it into a realm in your brain that says that's either a pleasurable thing, or it's a welcome thing, or it's dangerous, and I want nothing to do with it. So your brain is essentially recognizing things that it's sensing, and it's classifying what those things are, and next time you see or sense that thing, it's going to be recalled and you can act upon it. So if we move on to other systems, right? So I'm sure there's designers in the room or other folks who work with visual systems. You know, these visual systems are, these are, these are fabricated. These are man-made systems. Typography and letters, hieroglyphics. You know, the, the world has always relied on graphic systems to communicate. Uh, art, uh, 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 visual symbols such as iconography, where's the bathroom, <laughs> right? You know, uh, uh, visual uh, facial expressions and hand gestures. These are things that you try and read in body language. Even dance, dance is a form of expression, so you can try and imbue meaning into that. Other areas of sensing, right? So you've got the olfactory, your, your sense of smell, the ability to, to take advantage of natural aromas and also fabricated aromas. Think about the, bold, the boldness of the smell of burning toast, right? You, you know what burning toast smells like. Uh, you, 
but then you have much more subtle aromas, things that are much more subconscious, things like pheromones, right? If you're attracted to somebody and it's like, I don't know why I'm attracted to you, but I really like that. Well, you know, all the fragrance companies are putting these pheromones and things like this into their fragrances so that you're more attracted to them. So these are signals that your brain is picking up on and mapping meaning to. This is where things get a little bit more interesting, non-traditional senses like the sense of touch. So if you think about the sense of touch, we think about what it might feel like to touch hands or embrace or to hug or to kiss or to bump into someone. Those are much more uh, abrupt kinds of touches. If you think about very, very subtle touches, like when you see the hair raising on the flesh of this person, these are actually fine-tuned, high-frequency uh, vibrations. So as you're touching something, if it's smooth, it doesn't vibrate very much. If it's coarse, it's vibrating a lot, and your body is picking up and mapping those vibration patterns into your brain. You can tell smooth from rough because you've associated a word with smooth or rough, but it's really a vibration pattern that's telling your brain what it is. <clears throat> Another one, which if you get outside of the body and beyond the body, we have things like ambient sig signals. So humidity levels in the room, or the temperature, or time. So this, these notions that are more conceptual can give you inferences around how your brain will map meaning to that. So have you ever sat down in a chair and it was warm and you were thinking to yourself, who was the person that sat here before me, right? You strung out a whole sentence in your mind related to the warmth of a chair seat, right? And, and you think about fingerprints on glass or a footprint in the mud, you're starting to tell a story around what does that mean? It means someone was here recently, they might be heavy, they have a big foot, and so there's all this meaning that's going on with simple visual ambient clues. And then lastly, we get into really sort of the, 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 sort of the radical fringe of, of thinking about your senses and this notion of proximity. And so if you have someone maybe sneak up behind you to scare you and you've maybe caught them, you know, it says, ah, I, I knew you were there. Well, I didn't see you, I didn't smell you, I didn't hear you, but how did you know they were there, right? There's, you know, the other items are, if you've ever driven and you've driven to a stoplight and your windows are up and you feel this, this looming feeling like someone's looking at you, and then you look over at the car next to you and someone's looking at you, how do you explain that, right? These are all subtle things that we have yet to explain, but science is starting to understand how the brain is functioning and how these signals are starting to be recognized and classified, whether they be very obvious or very subtle. So inside of the way the brain works, I'm not going to get into neuroscience here, uh, but you've got different regions of the brain that do different things. And so you have parts of the brain that control your muscles. So the ability to speak is one part language and cognitive ability, but mostly the ability to speak isn't language, it's being able to properly move your mouth right, in a particular way. It's how you control your, your diaphragm to breathe, how you move your mouth and tongue to get the words out. So a large part of speech training is muscular, and it's in the motor cortex, versus other cognitive areas where you're dealing with language itself. Well, let's talk a little bit about language. Well, so right here at Berkeley, they've got one of the world's finest neuroscience departments, uh, and focus on language development and language learning, and they've started to map out regions at a very fine level across many, many different types of humans around the world, and starting to look at where are some consistent places in the brain where you can detect actual words or, or uh, verbal concepts. Uh, and so as technologies get better and better, and as science moves further and further, we're gonna have a much better idea of where language is located and how it's processed, what triggers language and communication, uh, not just the outcome of it. So coming back to the future of communication, now that you understand a little bit more about sort of the, the breadth of your different senses and how those senses work in corresponding with your brain, how does all that work with technology, right? So um, well, I've used a couple of words here uh, in kind of describing the way the brain works, uh, such as recognizing things, like I'm recognizing patterns, and I'm classifying patterns, and I'm recalling some of these patterns to take an action. Well, that's very much like software, right? You're starting to write software that understands how to recognize new patterns 
and how to recall and match those patterns using artificial intelligence. So this is really, we talk about it as the future of communication, but this is not a future like, a, it's not a science fiction thing. This is not sci-fi, this is real. And it's been real for decades. So if anyone knows someone who has a pacemaker or a cochlear implant, these are all intelligent bionic wearable devices. They're used for a purpose for encoding or decoding the brain. If you think about someone who's lost a limb and they have a prosthetic arm or a leg, these now use different things like EMG sensors to understand electrical impulses in the muscles in order to trigger the legs to move in a way that are more comfortable and more natural. Well, what's happening right now is as technology has advanced and sensors are advancing at such a pace, you know, what took hundreds of years to get to here are going, we're going to see the next 10 years, we're going to see huge leaps in technology and products, and we're going to see huge shifts in who we see walking down the street. We're going to see people with bionic legs walking down the street and people who are unsighted being able to see using technology. We're, and with our technology, we're going to have more and more people who are nonverbal being able to communicate verbally uh, with others. So this slide talks a little bit about how the trans, you know, things have dematerialized. So uh, back in the day, we had a computer, or we had a pager, or we had a feature phone. Well, each of these things did one thing kind of really well. And then came the smartphone, and then the smartphone kind of killed off all of these things because it can kind of do all the basic functionality that all those things once did. So you're, all this technology is consolidating and centralizing in a small little thing you can put in your pocket. Well, that's really great, but the next wave is actually going back the other way, where you're starting to introduce more and more, like literally hundreds of thousands of new kinds of sensors uh, that can be used for different things. So we have tactile sensors. So think about uh, yarn. Think about yarn that your clothing is made out of. Companies like Google are now developing yarn that is conductive so that you can create an X, Y, or a, a, a pattern in your clothing, and it becomes like a touchpad. Now you're taking fabric and turning it into a computer. Uh, you have, if you see the, the picture of the grain of rice and the little implantable chip, that's an RFID chip with a magnetometer in it, right? So you can, all, you can basically implant a little chip into your hand and always know where, where due north is, because <laughs> it, it vibrates and lets you know which direction you're going. <coughs> uh, there's a contact lens now that has a, 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 literally a microscopic sensor to detect your glucose and a Bluetooth antenna to communicate real-time data around your, your, your insulin level and your glucose levels to your smartphone so that you can have real-time monitoring in a contact lens. No more, no more pinpricks with needles. And the thing in the, in the top right is that is literally a brain chip. It has hundreds of little electrodes that can be placed under the skull right on the surface of the brain and during a, during a brain surgery, individuals can have multiple chips placed in to detect literally millions of neural firings in the brain with very, very small technology. So that was just really on the decoding side. So those are kinds of sensors that are being used to uh, understand what's going on in the body and expressing data out. Now there's other kinds of sensors that are, are being developed that are for Inc uh, encoding the brain. So think about, I want to, to learn a new task or a, learn a new skill. Um, you have things like a haptic layer, like a vest with all these vibration motors on it. Uh, and as it receives information, these different vibration motors vibrate at different patterns and in different places. And your mind actually, if you know what the meaning of that was beforehand, Literally in minutes, you can start to understand what those vibration patterns are so that the next time that vibration pattern happens, you know what the message was. These are things that are being experimented with in military applications and, and all kinds of other blind uh, applications. You also have deep brain stimulation for things like Parkinson's, where you can send and receive electrical currents directly to specific regions of the brain. Uh, you have bionic eyes that can directly take input data and encode information into your optic nerve and into your visual cortex. Uh, and then lastly, you might have read about things that Elon Musk and a few other notable people uh, in the area are working on. Uh, this one happens to be called neural lace. Uh, it's, an, it's like an injectable or an implantable lace that 
sort of promises to, to give you wide coverage across your brain, to, to be able to not just pick up weak signals in the brain, but be able to understand literally sensing trillions of synaptic firings in the moment. So these are things that are happening literally right now. So what are we doing at Cognition? Well, I mean, we're dealing with the day-to-day the -day realities of trying to build applications for people with severe disabilities so that they can communicate and use these latest technologies today in practical applications for speaking and communicating. So whether that be having a touch interface where they squiggle on the surface of an iPhone or on a device or a tactile surface, we have machine learning and AI analyzing all those gestures so that we can make those gestures easier for them to use. So we're not forcing the user to learn the technology, we're allowing the technology to learn the user so that it becomes a little bit more natural. You don't have to figure it out, it just figures you out. <coughs> and further, in the areas of brain science, we're developing uh, software uh, that improves the signal-to-noise ratio of EEG sensor data. Um, some of you may have heard of EEG sensors. It's uh, the electrodes you can just wear on the top of your surface of your head. Uh, and it's picking up uh, surface brain, uh, brain activity. And so what we're doing is we're analyzing that brainwave data and doing signal processing on it so that we're not trying to figure out how the brain works. We're trying to figure out how to allow the brain to remotely control things with greater ease. Because we see the BCI, or the brain-computer interface, as being the next great interface for really making the world uh, a much more interesting place, right? You can control things without having to pull things out of your hands and so on. <clears throat> so I wanted to, to sort of leave you with this. Uh, we're developing a, a, a solution uh, that enables people to literally think in order to speak. And I wanted to share a video with you to give you an idea of what we're doing uh, so that you can start to get excited about the things that are coming in the realm of unlocking communication for many people in the world. If you can imagine not being able to talk, she can't communicate like you or I. You can imagine not having a, a voice. I have been working for years to get a system that works for Mia. Yeah. But when she grabbed prose, I want Plato. The reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we want to democratize voice for millions of people. What we do with the EEG is we take the data that comes from your brain waves to have pros speak a phrase out loud. Liz is now able to think and pros speaks on her behalf. Communication is everything for her. I want it to impact the rest of their lives. Using brain and facial inputs. I mean, this is, this is history. <laughs> and you're watching. The world we're going to create is that every single person, regardless of your ability, is going to be able to communicate. I love you. It's just going to happen. Thank you for your attention and uh, appreciate your support. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andreas.